Hello, this is Gear Up and I'm Mike Steven. Today we're going to talk about uh, how to get your bike ready to hit the trails in the spring. The first thing I'm going to say is you've already taken your suspension off and brought it down to a shop to get your rear shock and your front fork serviced and overhauled so that you don't have to go into the big line that's <laughs> first thing in the spring at the shop. So you should already have these reinstalled back onto your bicycle. They got serviced. You're good to go with just the fine tuning stuff. So first off, uh, I would say tire pressure is one of your first things that you're going to do. If you have tubes, it's very, very, very common for your tubes to have let out some air. So don't think that your tubes are flat and don't think that you need to buy new ones if they're completely flat. Just add some air to them and bring them up to pressure and then uh, check them in a couple days. And if they haven't lost very many PSI, like two or three PSI is fine, then you have no holes. They have micro holes in them and that's completely normal and you don't need to replace them if they just have micro holes. Um, so recommendation when you're pumping up your tires is uh, to always over pressure your uh, uh, rear tire uh, by two PSI or under pressure your front by two to three PSI. So what that does is that allows the bike to corner a little bit easier. It falls into corners a little bit nicer. Uh, myself, I run tubeless. So in the springtime, I've always got to add some fresh sealant because the sealant that you added in there in the fall or whenever, that sealant has all dried up. So you've got to pop some new sealant in. Uh, most people will just uh, pull the valve core out and squirt the sealant in with a syringe or a bottle. Uh, it's a pretty easy thing to do yourself at home or you know, like I say, you can bring it to your local shop and they'll take care of you. When putting in sealant, like I say, it's about three to four months sealant dries out. So you still might not be losing air, but it's just simply that there's no extra sealant to go into the next puncture. So if you do get a little bit of a puncture, you're gonna be putting a tube in out on the trail so, uh, versus the sealant just plugging that hole. So topping up sealant, getting the tire pressure up. Um, the one thing I was gonna explain is ty with tire pressure is um, tire pressure is relative to how much you weigh, how aggressive you are, and what type of riding you like to do. For the most part, you can run a lot lower air pressure with tubeless. I run tubeless, so I run in the ballpark of, uh, let's see, it's been a while, <laughs> 26 PSI in the front and 28, uh, 29 in the back, something like that. So that's what I run in my bike, um, but I'm heavier. So if you're lighter, you can kind of take those pressures down a little bit. There's lots of really cool apps on, uh, out on the web uh, t dealing with uh, weight versus tire pressure and even setting up your suspension, which is what we're gonna talk about next. So if you have front and rear suspension on your bicycle, another thing that could have happened over the winter is that your air pressure could have dropped a few PSI. These pump, or th this shock for example, can take like 300 pounds pressure. So it can take quite a bit of pressure. Um, and holding that pressure over six months not being used, sometimes a little bit can come out, it is possible. And for your uh, shock not to be faulty. So you're just gonna open up the air valve, put a shock pump onto it, put it to the correct PSI. All your settings should be good. Your rebound setting is the red one. Your compression is the blue, uh, and that's universal with uh, uh, mountain bike suspension, uh, that compression is blue and rebound is red, uh, for most brands that I know of at least. Um, the two big ones for sure. <laughs> um, uh, again, adding the, the air to your front shock is just done underneath this, just opens up and Yes, you do need to use a shock pump. And if you don't have one and you have a full suspension bike, I recommend getting one simply because uh, having the correct PSI in your bike and, and the correct uh, shock pressure and fork pressure will make the bike handle a lot better. Um, so having that, you probably won't carry it with you on the trail, but having that back at your workshop at home, it's awfully nice to be able to dial those things in. Again, there's apps out there. Norco, for example, has an amazing app called Ride Aligned. If you look up Ride Aligned, and what uh, the Ride Aligned does is it tells you everything from how wide your bars should be uh, to uh, <laughs> your PSI and your tires, your shock pressure, um, how many clicks out your rebound should be, how many clicks out your high and low speed compression should be. So it's, it's a really detailed app that will dial in your bike 
really quite close to where you'll want to ride it. Uh, so again, uh, different companies will probably have a similar app. Um, so look for those apps because they, they, they really do work quite well. Or talk to your local bike shop that you got the bike from and they can probably direct you in the ways uh, to set up the suspension properly. One note on uh, when you're putting pressure in your tires, a lot of people like to use a compressor. I will honestly say that a compressor is slower to pump up your tires. And the reason why I say that is if you're setting to an exact pressure with a press to valve, so let's thread this onto where it should be. With a press to valve, you open up the press to valve, you put on the pump. If you're using a compressor, you have to thread an adapter on there and then put the compressor line on there, then check the air pressure. When in actual fact, to do the whole thing, all you need to do is get a floor pump, something like that, put it on, it's usually two or three strokes to get it back up to PSI, and you, you can see on the gauge exactly what your pressure is so that you monitor your pressure. So every time before I ride, I uh, check my air pressure. It's a super uh, uh, good thing to check, and especially with tubeless. Tubeless, you will lose some air pressure uh, in a 24 hour period that will be noticeable. Uh, with tubes, it's probably about a week before you'll notice air pressure changes, but uh, with tubeless, you'll definitely notice it quickly. So we've gone over uh, getting those uh, wheels up and running, getting your suspension up and going. Probably the most important parts of your bike are up in the front end of the bike. It's not a bad idea to inspect the welds and look for cracks, look for any damage that might have happened. So you've cleaned up your bike in the fall like you should have, and it's looking like ni nice and glossy like this one. And you're just looking for cracks, high stress areas down here, down in the bottom back bracket area is also another high stress area. But I focus on the ones at the front of the bike. If anything goes wrong at the front of the bike, you're gonna have a really bad day. If something happens at the back of the bike, you can usually kind of ride it out or uh, somewhat gracefully fall. Whereas something happens in the front end, you're probably gonna go straight to your face. So <clears throat> uh, on that note, checking your uh, um, bar uh, clamp pressures. So checking the stem bolts and making sure that you have the, the correct pressure on the handlebars. Every manufacturer will have X number of Newton meters uh, uh, of force to tighten those things down. And again, your stem bolts here. So that's what holds kind of your front end together is these two bolts here, and then these four bolts hold the handlebar on. So those are important to check. Also, um, a, a, mis <laughs> a thing that people make a mistake on, this bolt that's on the very top here is actually just to adjust headset tension. So how much tension is being put on these bearings here. So you don't want to crank the heck out of that guy ever. Um, you'll only touch it if you're adjusting your headset uh, pressure. If you've got looseness in your headset, and you need to snug it up or it's feeling really grindy and tight and you want to loosen it off a little bit. Um, the next things to check for sure, things like grips. Most grips nowadays are lock-on grips. And again, it's part of the front end of the bike. So check, check uh, your controls and your grips. Uh, make sure that they're snug. Again, there's gonna be manufacturer spec. Um, another way to do it is to slowly tighten it until you can't move it anymore. Like with a good hard spin, if you can't move it, your grip is tight enough. Uh, aluminum bolts are very easy to strip out, so be very careful. If you're not confident, go by the torque specs and use a torque wrench. Whereas if you are confident, uh, some riders like myself, uh, I do choose to just use an Allen key and quickly go over the bolts and make sure that they're snug. Um, next up to bat, uh, uh, just give your wheels a spin. If you spin your rear wheel, you're gonna notice that all you can hear is the free hub body. So what I wanna do is I wanna pedal as I'm doing that and listen for any brake rub. If there's a bunch of brake rub, you wanna center that caliper, get that caliper adjusted over top of the disc so that you're not wasting energy. The discs make a really loud noise for not very much resistance, so don't be super worried about it. If you can't get this dialed in properly, don't be stressed about it because it's, it's uh, uh, you can take it to a shop, they can do it fairly quickly and they can help you out. Um, uh, the front wheel, obviously, you can just spin it and 
Again, it should be nice and silent. You shouldn't be hearing any shing, shing, shing of the disc. That could be a bent disc. That could be uh, uh, just a misaligned disc. You'd have to diagnose those. Um, and then really the last thing, I'm not gonna get into shifting because shifting is a whole can of worms. There's high, low limit screws, there's cable tension, there's all sorts of things that come into the equation and really you need to know how to troubleshoot to do shifting properly. Uh, but another thing that you can do is add some lube to your chain. Uh, a lot of people buy these beautiful bikes and don't lube them very often. If you lube your chain, your chain will last better, it'll shift better, it'll do everything better. It'll, uh, yeah, it, it'll just be a lot nicer bike to ride, a lot quieter bike to ride. Uh, in the springtime, it's usually a little bit wetter, so I use a wet lubricant. In the middle of summer, here in Cranbrook, it's quite dry, so I use a, I use a dry lubricant uh, during the summertime. And basically, to put a lubricant on, all you need to do is pedal the bike, and you just drip some lubricant just along the chain there and just running back uh, you can run forwards or backwards this one i'm running forwards and you just want to apply enough so that you've got good coverage pedal it backwards a bunch of times and then shift through the gears right through from bottom to top try not to pedal the bike super fast because some of the grease can come off and contaminate your disc then so Try to pedal it at a, at a very reasonable rate. Uh, the other thing is after um, the, the lubricant has uh, been on your chain for I'd say about three or four minutes, something like that, five minutes, some, some lubes are different, but for the most part, four or five minutes, it's already soaked into the places where it needs to be. You can just take a shop towel and uh, grab a hold of the bottom here and again, pedal backwards and wipe off the excess lubricant. There's still gonna be enough up on the cassette and stuff like that that, you can, uh, that you're gonna have lubrication everywhere. It's just not gonna be a dirt attractant if you wipe off that excess lube. Um, aside from that, um, I could tell you to check every single nut and bolt on the bike. It's not a bad idea just to make sure things are snug. You don't have to be a mechanic to make sure that your pivot bolts are snug. Uh, just making sure that uh, your derailleur is on snug, your hanger is on snug, your disc brakes are on snug. So all those Allen key bolts, for the most part, <clears throat> you can do most of the bike with these two tools. And this is like an Allen key anywhere from, I believe this is like a 2.5 and then it goes up to a six mil. So 2.5 to six millimeter Allen keys and the ones in between is really what you use for majority of the bike. There is some torques out there now. So um, torque spit heads, uh, specifically SRAM uses a lot of those, but uh, Torx is another one. So watch out for that. If it doesn't look like a hexagonal, if it looks more like a star, that's a Torx. Put a Torx in a Torx, put, a, put an Allen key in an Allen key. Um, but just going over the bike and making sure that everything's snug. You don't have to reef on anything, just making sure everything's snug. Because realistically, if you put it away at the end of last year, you had a safe ride, you had a good ride. Um, chances are it should be in fairly good shape. But those are the things that you can do in the springtime to get your bike ready. If you're not confident doing it yourself, definitely talk to your local bike shop. They'll definitely help you out and get you booked in. Just a little secret, uh, most bike shops are very busy in the springtime. It's kind of like winter tires, everybody that does it on the first snowfall. If you bring in your bike earlier, like in the, in the later seasons, like January, February, January, February is a fantastic time to bring your bike in because the technicians uh, have some time and they can get your stuff done and have it ready for spring. So if you're not doing it yourself, think about that possibly. Um, it'll, it'll get your bike back into your hands and you'll be able to ride much quicker. Um, but uh, like I say, if you have any questions, pop into your local bike shop. I'm sure they're willing to help you out. Uh, this has been Gear Up, and I'm Mike Steven.
This is Gear Up and I'm Mike Steven. Today we're going to talk about footwear. Um, I just want to start this by saying this isn't explaining all footwear that's out there, but this is just giving you a bit of an idea that there is specific footwear that's designed to do different things and if you're a person that figures that one pair of shoes can kind of cover everything, um, yes it can, but there are shoes that will do specific things better. Uh, an example of that, <clears throat> you go out running. Um, a running shoe is going to be something that's built very breathable. It's going to give you high breathability so that on that hot day when you're putting out lots of effort, the perspiration off your foot can kind of just dissipate and you're going to be a lot more comfortable in the shoe. If you look at the amount of cushioning in this shoe, a ton of cushioning in this shoe. This is called Fresh Foam. It's a, it's a technology that uh, uh, New Balance is using and it's a really interesting technology that uses uh, a foam that doesn't compress over time. So it, it, it it retains its shape and it continues to cushion for a long time to come. Um, now to just confuse you right off the bat, there's a whole nother theory on running, believe it or not. These are two different running shoes. This right here is a barefoot runner. Um, this is a traditional runner. Uh, barefoot running has come new into the marketplace. Um, it's new and it's old all at the same time. Uh, barefoot running uh, kind of comes way back from when we didn't have shoes, when we basically put something on the bottom of our feet to protect our feet, like a bit of leather, and uh, just strap that onto our feet, and that was our footwear. What some people are finding um, is that if you wear barefoot technology and you slowly build up the strength of your feet, that barefoot can actually um, be a very, very... Um, realistic way to run because you've got your arch that's in your foot. In a shoe like this, your arch is pinned and it's cushioned and it's supported and it's it's got all these things going on. In this guy, this shoe is designed to be basically protection for the bottom of your foot and allow all the muscles in your feet to work independently and strengthen and get stronger and stronger. The, the arch, going back to that, the arch is kind of like a spring. It's designed to absorb impact and to uh, spring off of. So they're finding uh, that the people that can uh, use, use the barefoot technology are achieving some pretty interesting <laughs> running times because A, it's very light, and B, they're, they're making the muscles in their feet really strong versus over supporting all the muscles in your feet and not having very strong feet. So just kind of an interesting thing that's out there, both being running shoes. I, I use barefoot technology not to run in, but I use it, I, I love it for kayaking or cliff jumping or anything like that because it's just like, it's kind of a really lightweight shoe that you can take with you in the kayak or that you can climb up a cliff face and then jump off into the water and it doesn't absorb a lot of water. So there are specific water shoes, but this could be a multi-purpose shoe for somebody. Um, uh, next up, uh, bike shoes. A lot of people figure that... Uh, you don't need anything special on a bike. And I'm just talking about regular pedals here, flat pedals. Um, I'm not talking about any of the ones that you clip into or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> the honest truth is that if you wear a bicycle specific shoe, you're gonna notice some things right away. You're gonna notice that the rubber is super soft and tacky. This, this uh, rubber technology is called stealth rubber. It's the same rubber that they use in climbing shoes. So climbing shoes that you're kind of purchasing your toe on a granite face and hoping that, that rubber will stick to your next hold um, is what's sticking you to the pedals. So it's a very soft pliable rubber. It grips really well to the pedals and you don't slide off. When you only have four contact points on a bicycle, your hands and your feet, it's important not to lose them or slip off of them. So having a grippy rubber like this on the bottom of the foot makes a huge difference. Also having a big, flat, low profile, very stable platform to stand on really helps. It makes you feel much more planted and solid out there riding in the trails. Um, on top of that, yeah, it's gonna be breathable. It's got a little bit of toe protection so that if you smash your toe into a rock, you've got a little bit of protection because sometimes that does happen. Your pedal's on the low side and you catch a rock. Uh, it helps out a little bit there. Um, all in all, what I'm trying to get at is with all the different types of footwear, there is definitely something 
that can excel in any area that you have a passion for. So no matter what area you have a passion for in outdoor experiences or indoor experiences um, that you need footwear for, you can definitely fine tune into something. Uh, something like this guy, this is one of my favorite boots on our wall. Um, it looks like a really beefy boot, but it actually has a fairly soft forefoot, so it's fairly flexible. But for wintertime, having this extra high cuff is super awesome. You don't need to wear a gaiter. Your pant comes down far enough that really if you go in snow over, over your boot top, again, I'm not talking extreme <laughs> situations where you're hiking through miles and miles of this. You'd need a gaiter for sure at that point. But this really helps when you're just jumping out of the truck and you, you land in the snow. Having that extra support up, up the top protects your ankle if you're carrying a backpack. So like a hiking boot, is designed so that if you start to roll your ankle um, and you have an 80 pound pack that isn't normal for you to be carrying, it helps support that ankle so that you don't blow out through the side. So if you are carrying a heavy pack or heavy loads, or if you are working <coughs> in, a, in a boot that you need to be able to kick and be able to uh, move dirt out of the way or scuff dirt out of the way, a hiking boot's a very good choice for that. Uh, it's great for working. It's great for pastime of obviously hiking. Um, this boot I love wearing for snowshoeing. I use this snowshoeing and uh, on my OAC skis. Um, but just a really good all-around versatile boot. I'll wear this in the winter or the summer because it's waterproof to here. It's all leather, so you can keep the waterproofing up on it. And uh, whether you're in the summer or the winter, um, my feet stay warm and dry. And then the casual shoes. Casual shoes. This is the Kootenai shoe right here. So whether you live in the East or West Kootenays, this is the footwear of choice. Uh, apparently you go to any party and you see a million pairs of these at the door. And what it is, it's actually uh, an Australian cowboy boot in essence, but that has gained popularity because they're nice and easy to slip on. They're extremely durable. They're made of like full grain leather and there isn't very much extra fabric sewn in and stuff like that. It's just a full leather boot. So you get good wear and tear. You get a tough sole with some good grip on it and you get the handy little loops to pull it on quick so that you can take it on and off real quickly. But I think that's why it uh, gains so much popularity in the area is because you can just whip it on, throw it on real quick. And whether it be a little bit of a slushy day out there or whether it be in the summertime and you want to keep burrs out of your shoes, does the same kind of thing but kind of interesting heritage it being an Australian in essence cowboy boot. So I hope I've got it at the point that uh, you can definitely benefit from getting some specific footwear uh, but by no means am I saying that you have to have a billion pairs of footwear to do the things that you do. It will make your experience maybe more enjoyable and more supportive and you may progress a little bit faster, but man, you can do almost anything and anything. I've seen it done for sure. Um, but if you have any questions, pop into your local uh, shoe shop and uh, ask them the questions and uh, I'm sure they can guide you into the right pair of footwear. Do a little bit of research and uh, I'm sure you'll get the right uh, shoe for you. Hopefully this sheds some light on uh, some of the different attributes of footwear. Um, but the most important thing probably is for a good fit. So the, the, the shoe or boot should fit really nice right out of the box. Um, spend some time in it. Uh, most stores will allow you to take them home for the evening and wear them around on your carpet before you make a decision. But definitely fit is, fit is key um, uh, when you're buying footwear. Thanks for watching. I'm Mike Stevens.